Association for. Um, and the mission of GPS is to help fill the gap between what we learn in the classroom and what goes on in the real world. We strive to offer new and cutting edge perspectives on global affairs. Um, recognizing that there are an increasing number of players on today's world stage, we try to offer a very wide um, range of backgrounds, and we're really happy today to be co-hosting with the politic and learn a little bit to learn a little bit more about intelligence um, from Mr. Seals. Can you thank you? Reality and intelligence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I get the honor of doing the introduction. I don't know. You have to ask Alessandra. She's in charge. Do you talk about it? Sorry, we think we're having these dynamics here that are just kind of fun to watch. <laughs> All right. So um, teamwork. Um, my name's Justin. To those of you that I don't know in the audience, I am one of the two editors in chief of the Politic. Um, it is with great pleasure that I have the opportunity of introducing our guest speaker, Mr. Steele, today, uh, alongside Paul Sandra and GPS. So, a little bit about Mr. Steele before I turn things over, and just a general update on what the format of this event will look like. Uh, Mr. Steele has prepared a presentation of about 30 minutes in length. Um, he has made a guarantee that you will not be bored in the slightest during this presentation. Well, during the Q&A. Okay. The Q&A is even more exciting, so uh, he'll present for about 30 minutes. Uh, prepare your questions, absolutely anything goes. I'm speaking correctly there. And I don't tell lies. He doesn't tell lies. Um, and so we'll have Q&A for about 30 minutes or 45 minutes, so um, start thinking about what you'd like to ask. So a little introduction about Mr. Steele is that in addition to serving with the Marines in the Central Intelligence Agency for nine years, he's a long-time intelligence reformer and a pathfinder in both open source everything and public intelligence in the public interest. A former spy, honorary hacker, and number one Amazon reviewer for nonfiction reading in 98 categories as well as briefly a candidate for the Reform Party presidential nomination in 2012. He's now the pro bono CEO of Perth Intelligence Network. Mr. Steele is also the publisher of Phi Beta Iota, a public intelligence blog, whose motto is, the truth at any cost, though is all other costs. So, it's my pleasure. Mr. Steele, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. If any of you don't get a chance, or if you have to leave early, you don't get a chance to ask a question, pick up one of my cards, and any subject line with Yale at the beginning will get my attention. Okay? So, for those of you that only came to eat, uh, steel-yale-6 is the tiny URL for this briefing. So you can pull it down, you can share it with others, I would be very glad uh, to do that. Now, I, I considered doing a statesman-like brief, and it didn't work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw 30 pictures at you, one minute each. And my intent is to provoke you into thinking about what you're not learning at Yale. Okay? And if there's anyone I haven't pissed off by the end of this meeting, please come see me. And I will do my very best uh, to finish the job. So who owns the future? Not us. Although the United States is one of the major powers in terms of population, our population consists largely of idiots. And unfortunately, we have to understand, as I lecture General Scowcroft, that the only positive constructive thing the United States can do is come up with a strategic analytic model, true cost economics that actually helps people make the right decisions and not repeat the mistakes of the United States of America uh, these past 50 years. Now these are the 10 high level threats to humanity. Dr. Strowcroft was the US representative on the UN high level panel. They wrote a book about this called A More Secure World, Our Shared Responsibility. And I would invite you to think about how many of these threats the U.S. government is actually addressing. These are 12 core national policies. I pulled these out of various Mandate for Change books from various presidential administrations. This is important because we do policies based on giving taxpayer money to the people that bribe the U.S. government. We don't do policies based on what's useful for the American public. We don't do policies based on everything together, like what are the implications of fracking for water and health, for example. So you have to have all of the policies at one time. That's one of the problems with your narrow education. It's not properly multidisciplinary. It's not properly expansive, integrating the humanities, philosophy, and science at least for most of you, and that's one of the things I'd love to change. Now this is that model together. The US government is focused on those two little red dots. 
because war is profitable for the 1%. Peace is actually much more profitable for the 99% and for the totality of humanity. Much, much more money is generated by peace than by war. But because it's not concentrated, there are no advocates for peace in that sense. And that's where the humanities comes in. Morality is a way of transmitting lessons learned from one generation to the next. And that's where Yale has it over Harvard big time. Um, now, whole systems analytics. We don't think this way. We really don't actually consider the implications of our various policies. The Keystone Pipeline is idiocy. We're using water we don't have to flush tar sands we don't need to pipe trash across America so that some legacy refineries for some really rich guys in Texas can export fuel to England. Okay? That's what the Keystone Pipeline is about. Washington has been bought and paid for on that because our citizens are not paying attention and are not smart enough to figure this out. Now, what form should intelligence take? And we'll talk about intelligence as decision support. Intelligence is not about secret sources and methods. Intelligence is about supporting a decision. It's about the output. And there are four levels of intelligence. This is from Jan Herring, the first National Intelligence Officer for Science and Technology. At the bottom level, you want to be able to share information. I wrote an article for Counterpunch <coughs> called uh, Intelligence for the President and Everybody Else. We don't provide intelligence to the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Interior, uh, the Department of Energy. We only provide pseudo-intelligence in top secret fashion. We can talk about this more in Q&A, but if you can't provide the same decision support to Congress, which in theory is overseeing the executive, and to the academics, and to the media, and to the public, then what you're going to end up with is secret decision making that is not in the public interest. And then you have help desks and future near and future far. Now, I wrote an article or chapter in, uh, in the most recent book on intelligence by Routledge, uh, the Routledge Companion of Intelligence Studies, and the chapter is called The Evolving Craft of Intelligence. There are three eras of intelligence. The first era is the era of secret war, where you basically do bad things because you can. The second era, which Sherman Kent initiated, was the era of strategic analytics. And that was very quickly trashed by the clandestine service. In 1963 or 1968, Harry Truman wrote an article in the Washington Post saying he had never envisioned CIA getting so far out of control. It was supposed to be an analytic service that took what everybody else had already collected and made sense out of it. It was not supposed to be a neo-Nazi clandestine service. Okay? We also imported over 100 Nazis every single year. And we used gold that we discovered in, in the Philippines to basically reinsert the fascists into Italy and, and Germany um, and Japan. All right, so there's a lot of, this is what's called flawed facts. We'll talk about that some more. So these are, these are the first and second eras, covert action. Covert action is crazy. Covert action means that you're paying somebody to get their government to do something that is against their best interests. That's what it boils down to. It's not sustainable. It ends up being bad for everybody. Now, I am a loyal American who believes in America the Beautiful, and I want to restore the Constitution. I want to restore the Republic. Right now, we are spending $75 billion a year, and that's a conservative estimate, on secret intelligence that is largely worthless. Now, since I am a known radical reformer, I thought I would quote General Tony Zinni, a fellow Marine. He is on record as saying that when he was Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Central Command, he got, at best, 4% of what he needed to know from the secret community. And here you have Jim Bamford. He ends his book, Body of Secrets, about NSA and the trillions of dollars that NSA has spent trying to build the ultimate computer with these words, and I'll read them. Eventually, NSA may secretly achieve the ultimate in quickness, compatibility, and efficiency, a computer with petaflop and higher speeds shrunk into a container about a liter in size and powered by only about 10 watts of power. The human brain. This whole, um, what's this Kurzweil thing, singularity? That's crap, okay? The human brain is the one thing that is an infinite resource on this planet. It is the one thing that is infinitely connectable and scalable and expandable, all right? Not computers. 
Okay? Computers are as dumb as the worst piece of code. Computers are as open as the most unethical person at Google. All right? The human brain is what you have to work with. Now this is a chart that shows the totality of information. I did my second graduate thesis on strategic information mismanagement. And that red area is what can be known that is relevant to all of our different policies in 183 languages we don't speak. All right? And it shows you what the little pieces of the secret world are able to touch, including FBIS, which is the, the, the open source sort of uh, thing. Now, it gets worse. Don't worry about NSA's mass surveillance, because they're not actually processing it. However, when you are rich and famous, when you, are, when you are rich and famous in 10 or 15 years, you do need to worry because NSA has every bit you ever created. Okay, the problem with NSA is that it's collecting everything, not processing it. So on the one hand, it hasn't prevented a single terrorist incident, it hasn't done actually anything useful. But on the other hand, your life is an open book as long as you continue to carry an electronic device and they can reach back and spoil it later. <coughs> so we don't process this stuff. So why is intelligence so feeble? Well, it turns out that intelligence is feeble because the president and the politicians are being impacted by so many other influences, most of them offering either money or sex. Okay? The intelligence community used to have something called the Blue Moon Motel in Miami where we could offer sex, and we can offer money, um, but by and large, that's for foreigners. In the United States of America, money and sex rule, including, I'm afraid to say, pedophilia, which is a major problem among our elites and in Washington. It's not something you read about a lot, but if you search for it, you'll find it. Um, that's considered a privilege uh, to be able to do that. And the FBI is not actually there to stop high-level crimes. It goes after the little people. Out of all of the bankers that caused this financial crash, how many have been arrested? Zero. How many Occupy pro protesters have been arrested? Over 7,000. Those are the priorities right now in the United States of America. Arrest Occupy, do not arrest bankers. Okay? Now, with apologies to those of you whose parents are part of the elite, uh, you need to get a grip because the next generation is yours to fix. I had this conversation with my middle son in the car and it was a very philosophical answer. I said, what are you going to do to fix all the mistakes I've made? He says, Dad, we're just waiting for you to die. Okay. <laughs> so when your parents die, you're the adults. And you are inheriting a world that is very corrupt and very dirty and very troubled. Now, there are some, some good things about it. Why is intelligence so feeble? Part two. Secrecy and technology have displaced integrity and decision support. If you walk away from Yale with just one word, let that word be the word integrity. And integrity is not just about honor. Integrity is about coherence. It's about a 360 degree view. It is about taking into account the full diversity of all points of view. Our indigenous native forebearers were smarter than we are. I mean, they had what they call collective intelligence councils, and they'd sit around in a circle like this, and nobody left until everybody agreed. Okay? And it worked. It actually got all the information, all the diversity out there. Intelligence is about answers, actionable answers that help you make a decision. It is not about covert action or espionage or secret information. It's not even wisdom. All right? Intelligence is about applied decision support talk about that more. Now this is what we spend on war. Medard Gabel, who was the number two guy to Buckminster Fuller, uh, who, who was a member of our team that created the, the Earth Intelligence Network and the Earth Game, uh, he created this chart. For one third of what we spend on war today, we can eradicate every problem that humanity faces. The problem is that the only people paying governments to do things are the people who benefit from war and from corruption because the public is not as educated as it needs to be. And that's something we can talk about. 
So in the third era of intelligence, which I defined in, in my latest chapter, and I also did a, 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 an article in 1995 called Creating a Smart Nation. A smart nation is one in which every citizen is a collector, a producer, and a consumer of information oriented towards creating decision support. All right? It's not about throwing papers against the wall. It's not about just going through the motions to get a grade. It's about creating something that actually has a customer. If I were ever Secretary of Education, which hopefully will not happen before you graduate, uh, you don't get an A unless you have a customer for your paper. Who does your paper serve? Who helped you define what they needed to know so that you could actually, as a young academic, create new knowledge that's useful to somebody, not just you blowing smoke up your professor's ass, okay? You really can do more with what you do. Um, so these are the, the, the reasons you have intelligence, to illuminate true costs. True costs mean things like virtual water, all right, a gallon, um, uh, a serving of, of beef has 5,000 gallons of water in it. A serving of tomato has 20 gallons of water in it. Most of what we buy today has incalculable hours of child labor and tax avoidance integrated into that process. Most of what we buy today does not calculate the cost of consumption against the earth. It does not calculate the toxins that are introduced into your water. We have an industry based on chlorine, and we have water now that is poisoned by official government policy. And by the way, all the drugs that everybody except Yale flushes into the toilet, they don't get completely cleaned out when the water is processed. And you're now drinking somebody else's residue drugs. All right? Have a nice day. It's really scary. Um, now, open sources. This is something that I, uh, I'm not the original thinker of. But I pioneered this fight beginning in 1988. And this is the utility of open sources against the 10 high-level threats to humanity. And you would think that because of this utility, the intelligence community would be taking open sources more seriously. But it's not. Because you can't make a lot of money at SRA and SCIC and, and L3 with open sources because they're too inexpensive. I mean, I can answer questions about the future of the Nicaraguan government for $250 paid to a former governor of the bank. Okay? That's not profitable. That doesn't buy golf courses and Lear jets and all this other stuff. There's a better way to do this, but it does not put profits into the banks. Now, even if you get past all the problems that exist in the secret world, you end up having all of these information obstacles. Now, each of these is the title of the book. So you can actually go read my review of that book to get a summary of that information obstacle. You have fragmented knowledge. The entire academic profession has grown up splitting disciplines into sub-disciplines so people can get PhDs and know everything there is to know about nothing. Multidisciplinary academia does not exist in the United States of America. And the really, really good pioneers have moved to Singapore because Singapore lets them do the research that they want. And they're not constrained by Republican war against science and things like that. Um, humanities, religion and spirituality, philosophy, these are all the spaces between the dots. Science is the dots. This stuff is the spaces between the dots. Okay, It all has to be taken together. I was just reading a very tough book. It has way too much math on causality and philosophy. And the bottom line is that science is not about causality. Science is about the car and the engine and the gas and all the pieces. How the car is driven and whether the car kills somebody or not is a humanities issue. All right? And so you have to pull these two together. You can't have science without the humanities if you want to actually get somewhere. Now, in 1985, a number of us at CIA defined what we needed in a desktop analytic toolkit. And the reason we're all still suffering Windows 8, um, second-rate software, first-rate marketing, uh, is because the government doesn't care about actually doing decision support. These are 18 functionalities you don't have on your desktop today because nobody cares about actually making decision support. 
So this is something to, to think about, and this is something I want in an open source toolkit. We also don't have organizational intelligence, which Howard Walensky wrote about in, uh, in 1964. Everybody has a Rolodex, which has a name and a phone number, but it doesn't have the history, like Goldmine, which is one of the software programs for sales. It doesn't have the history of the calls and what kinds of private deals have been made and what the atmospherics are and so forth. Organizational intelligence means never forgetting anything and having it transfer from one generation to the next and across all boundaries. So there are eight tribes. And one of the things the U.S. government still hasn't come to grip with is the fact that it is the least important tribe. The U.S. government is the least important consumer, producer, and, and collector of information. These other seven tribes are vastly more important, but they don't share with each other either, and they don't share within each other. So what we have here is a, an information commons that has all these barriers built up. I mean, Harvard academics cite Harvard academics. They rarely cite Yale academics. They're actually citation cabals. You know, you cite me, I'll cite you, okay? So we can both get promoted. Uh, the whole academic citation system is corrupt. Uh, it is basically a, a make-believe effort. Now, obviously, there are exceptions. I tend to talk in hyper, uh, hyperbole. Um, now, think about this. This represents what the governments know in the red circle, and then all of these outer circles, all right? And one of the problems we have is that computers were designed without talking to a librarian. Computers are essentially a massive electronic trash basket, all right? And since we can't trust NSA and we can't trust Google, nobody's going to put their C drives uh, and all their email into the cloud, at least at this point if you have a brain. Okay? Eventually, we do need to have the C drives and the emails into a massive thing. Someone smarter than me had to point out that it takes three to play. But if you have the spare parts prices for all of the auto companies, you can get to the average spare part price without violating anyone's privacy so that you can understand what the average spare part price is and you can compare that to your own proprietary spare part price, all right? There's some amazing things that we can do with, with big data and data mining. And I will just say big data is essentially an industrial era concept. It's the wrong data, okay? Big data right now is data from an era that didn't understand holistic analytics and wasn't able to do it. Epoch B, Swarm Leadership is the original indigenous concept. Today, all of the tribes are running on top-down, because I said so, leadership. And that doesn't work, because it turns out the leadership is not very smart, and it's not very informed. It doesn't actually have everything that it needs. Now, these are the, the rules of the game as I would like to see them. And it boils down to starting with reality and being able to grasp what all the details are and being able to understand the water and the child labor and the, and the violation of the law. One of the, an excellent article just came out which points out that the third world is not dying because of third world government corruption. It's dying because of corruption by the elites that are doing capital flight and corruption by the multinational corporations that are basically taking everything without paying the tax revenues. So understanding what corruption really means in a given country is hugely important. Now here is the biggest difference between me and the existing uh, intelligence community. Right now, we have spies and lies. That's what we do for $75 billion a year. And we only do interstate conflict and, um, and terrorism in theory. Terrorism is not actually a threat, it's a tactic. The Americans use terrorism against the British. The Israelis use terrorism against the British. Um, it's just a tactic. But we don't actually take all of these targets seriously. One of the reasons why it's important to address poverty in the third world is so that they'll stay there. Okay? We have massive illegal immigration issues, in part because the governments and, and the United States is best pals with 42 dictators. All right? We actually support dictators over their publics. We do not live up to the ideals in our Constitution. And that turns out to be important. Will Durant in the Lessons of History, which was the capstone volume to their 11-volume st uh, story of civilization, says that morality 
is a value that is priceless because morality actually means legitimacy and legitimacy means sustainability and affordable cost. Is that kind of clear? Let's, let's come back to that in the questions and answers. If you have an illegitimate government, it has lost touch with its people, the people are going to start revolting and that is like sand in the gears. It starts raising the cost of doing business in a, in a very, very big and important way. So this is something we designed. Uh, and it essentially means, and you can do this now, with Twitter it's possible for every citizen to vote on every piece of legislation. Of course, that's the last thing that Washington <coughs> wants, because that will prevent them from charging 5% for providing the vote that they're being paid to provide. All right? But we're moving in an area, we're moving in a direction, I think it'll happen first at the township level. Towns and counties and states will start doing this before the national government does. I am a champion of open source everything. I used to be a champion of open source intelligence, but it turns out open source software is nothing unless you also have open source hardware, open cloud, open data, open spectrum. All of these have to work together. And the reason they're important is because 80 to 90% of the information that we need in order to make smart decisions about the future of this planet, they're controlled by people who don't trust the US government, who don't have clearances, who aren't US citizens, and who can't afford Microsoft. The Norwegian government, among many others, has told Microsoft they are no longer going to use Microsoft because they're not going to require their citizens to buy Microsoft in order to read government data. <clears throat> so we actually have to move India and Brazil and China and other countries toward open source everything, toward free open source platforms that will allow the public to connect with the information, which then leads to the public creating infinite wealth. All right? And this is my last, my next to last slide. I would like to find a university that understands that it's now possible to create a comprehensive architecture for information which has data at rest encryption. You have every right to have your information encrypted. You have every right to know who is touching your information. You have every right to place restrictions on who is allowed to touch your information and how they touch it. All right? We don't have that today. I believe we can create this. And what we do when we create this is we allow every individual to come in with the information they have and the information they know. I'll give you one simple example to illuminate why this matters. Reebok was having a meeting because they were going bankrupt and they didn't know what they were going to do to make their next year successful. And they were having this meeting of vice presidents in the basement. And this is, I think, out of one of the innovation books. And a security guard kept walking back and forth. And finally, he sat down. The fact that Reebok allowed him to sit down is a testament to that company's culture. And after a few minutes, he said, hey, security guards need shoes that look professional but work like athletic shoes. Reebok made $28 million the next year off security guard shoes that are like athletic shoes. Okay? Because they listened to a security guard. This is what's called collective intelligence, and wisdom of the crowds, and the army of Davids, and all that stuff. We do not lack for information. We lack for integrity and compassion. And that's one of the reasons why I think the humanities is so very, very important. It's not enough to know the so-called facts. You have to know the facts in context, and you have to know the facts in relation to the actual humanity that is going to bear the burden of your decisions going into the future. And I do believe that's it. Thank you, sir. Now we can talk about 9 11 and JFK and all the other stuff. <laughs> um, so, if anyone wants to get any more food at this time or if you have to leave, please go ahead. Um, so, gather your questions, but I think in the meantime, I'll start things off. The first question. So we'll give everyone a second just to shuffle around. Sure. What we'll next question? All right. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask the question that I'm sure some of the audience is going to ask, namely <laughs> Edward Snowden. Speak up, Justin. All right, we'll do. Uh, so I'm going to ask the question that I'm sure everyone in the audience wants to ask. Um, so in your presentation, you call yourself a faithful American. So we'll talk about Edward Snowden for a second. Give him a medal or send it to the gallows. The impact that Edward Snowden has had is certainly one that has caused people to nominate him for the Nobel Peace Prize. And he certainly has earned it much more so than Obama, who had been in office for 10 days when those idiots in Norway gave him 
the Norwegian uh, peace um, One of the problems that we have with the U.S. government is that it's so corrupt that it doesn't listen to internal dissidents. Okay. Before Snowden, there were people like Benny and Drake and Rowley. Uh, many people have been pointing out the problems. I have been pointing out for 25 years. I mean, I'm 60, 61 years old. I feel 40. But for the last 25 years, I have been fighting the U.S. government on being honest about intelligence and counterintelligence. And the U.S. government does not want to listen. Now, I don't know what the true foundation was for Snowden actually stealing the documents and, and releasing them a day before Obama was about to complain to Xi about cyber spying on the U.S. by China. China is light years ahead of us. You guys know how in Best Buy you can buy that thing that you plug a USB cord in and you plug it into an electrical socket and then upstairs you plug in another one and you have the USB cord come out. Okay, the Chinese have been riding the electrical circuits into NSA for the last 10 years. And this is NSA's biggest secret. They don't want Congress or the public to know this. But if you can do it in Best Buy, I assure you, the Chinese can do it now. All right, this is why NSA is trying to build its own power plant. Okay, they are really terrified. Um, because they live a lie. All right, I, when I testified to Senator Moynihan, God rest in peace, um, I said, the intelligence community does not use secrets, secrecy to protect secrets. It uses secrecy to bamboozle Congress. All right?